Welcome to the LA R Meetup at User Conference. Uh, my name is Silard, and I've been organizing uh, the LA R Meetup for a couple of years. But for this event, I would like to thank Jasmine here for putting this all together. I would like also to thank our sponsors, Car.com and Gravity. And uh, we'll have uh, on the panel people from both companies, and after that, you can talk to them, and they have uh, some t-shirts for you guys. Um, how many of you guys are from LA? All right. And how many of you are from LA but are not attending the conference? Okay, cool. So for all the others who are not from LA, I have a quick plug. If you ever come to LA, talk to me. I would like to have you talk at the LA Art Meetup. So uh, uh, you can uh, find me on the web. Uh, for uh, my Twitter is Data Science LA, and I would really like to have uh, more people from outside LA come and talk to the LA Art Meetup. So for now, uh, I would like to introduce uh, the moderator of. We'll have a talk by Yasmin, and then we'll have a, a panel moderated by Tarif. So uh, Tarif is from our studio, is the president of our studio, and he will MC the rest of this event. So please welcome Tarif. Thank you. So to our uh, I am just going to be the moderator here today. I wanted to introduce Yasmin, for those of you who don't know her. So Yasmin Lucero is a senior statistician at Gravity AOL with a PhD in mathematics, mathematical biology from UC Santa Cruz. Yasmin's postdoc research at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration had her working with large data sets that help study habitat and landscape data to better understand where good fish nurseries might be. At Gravity AOL for the past year and a half, Yasmin's focus has been on studying the effectiveness of the recommendation algorithms in production. I'd like to welcome Yasmin. Share. That's the link. I'll show it again at the end. Um, and yes, I'm coming from Gravity AOL, and uh, we put this panel together to just talk about R in production. So, for those of you who are not as familiar with kind of tech business terminology, I'm going to lay out a few terms. Production is just the technology word for, you know, what you do in business. It means like it's out there and it's like real. And uh, products is a word that gets used a little differently. Uh, in business, but it's sort of like the word for, basically it's the deliverable, it's the fundamental unit. In business, the product is the equivalent of the publication in academia. <laughs> and so, uh, just when I sort of thought about kind of how I wanted to lay the groundwork and set the framework for this panel discussion, I kind of decided that what we really want to talk about was kind of the different kinds of roles that R is playing in tech businesses, just from talking to our panelists, from my own experience and from talking to various people kind of out there trying to do data science in industry. And I kind of identified sort of different kinds of roles that it's like. So I've got four internal products and two external type products that are the kinds of ways people are using our in industry. Um, as I sort of said in the abstract, um, R is a sort of growing, it's, it's up until very recently been considered kind of an obscure toolkit that was coming from a world that was very foreign to business, and it's sort of, because of the growing importance of data analysis, people are sort of picking it up and using it more and more in this software technology context. And so these are sort of the ways that I'm seeing it. And then I'm gonna talk through each of these types of products, kind of just flesh it out a little bit more. And then I'm gonna kind of close by talking, talking a little bit about sort of ops and management and the kind of logistics side of using R as a tool in this context. And then I'm gonna pass it over to these guys to get really specific. So 
Um, the first class of product I identified is the one-off analytical product, which I think is very familiar to anyone. It's just sort of your basic analysis. And for basically everyone that I know doing data science in tech companies, this is sort of one of the sort of bread and butter tasks. And for many people, it's really all that they're doing in their jobs as statisticians at companies. But even people who aren't really big R users will often turn to R for these kinds of problems. And that was always true, that you would turn to R for a little analysis project. And that's just because um, you know, R has always been set out to be an interactive statistical computing environment. That's like the purpose. And so it's the toolkit. So naturally, when you want to do a little uh, analysis, that's a nice place to turn. Um, but especially in recent years, when I talk to people about why would you use R for this particular purpose, they, they really highlight our studio in particular and um, the way it has supported things like R Markdown and Sweeve better and, and, uh, the, the, and also Git integration. Those things that suddenly have, have created a more complete platform even than before. So people have always turned to R because it's got good graphics, it's got good statistical libraries, you can go do your analysis, but increasingly people are really just drawn to the ability to have a really clean, well-contained, reproducible workflow very organized, it's in one place, works well. Um, so I pulled a few examples. This is from one of our panelists, Haley Parker. Just, you know, she's got her Git repo and her sort of output report. And then this other one is um, just something I pulled off our pubs, which I hope Nathan Esau doesn't mind. I don't know who he is, but <laughs> it's just a screenshot of an example of what I'm talking about. And uh, just in general, if you're not familiar with um, these markdown reports and these HTML reports that you can generate, our pubs is a great place to go. It's a public site where you can go and see things that people publicly hosted. Go poke around and see what people can do with these tools. <clears throat> Um, the other class of sort of thing that I hear people doing with R in software a lot is this sort of automated reporting pipelines. Um, so a, a typical sort of example would be a little R, a little bash, cron tab, maybe an email alert at the end, you know, one of these <coughs> ungodly Frankensteinian pipelines that end up becoming, I don't know, I think we all do it, right? Because <laughs> it's, it's the tried and true technology uh, I, I found at least. Um, one talk in the use our program for Thursday morning they're talking about automated business reporting it's not necessarily just sort of bash email it might be that you I mean usually there's a little bash and a little crown tab mixed in there but maybe you're even generating markdown reports and loading them up to a server um, this is something I hear about people doing a lot a lot of people are using R in this way obviously you don't need to use R there's lots of other scripting languages that kind of can live in this role but um, the usual reasons for turning to R are you need the statistical libraries and you need the plotting capabilities. So if your task requires those things, this is a common tool for people to reach for. <coughs> the third internal type of package, um, and I uh, highlighted a couple of companies, my company and Google are just two examples of companies that I know are doing this, but I'm, lots of other people are doing this too, which is developing R packages for basically lots of miscellaneous internal tools, especially data APIs, connections to all the idiosyncratic data sources in your own company, and also developing just sort of basic utilities, things like special plotting metrics that are particular to your data structures, and special calculations, and special report generation functions, and just miscellaneous that is not of general interest, but is very useful to share with the company. And uh, you know, I know a lot of people, so any, any shop that has a relatively advanced group of R users tends to have one of these kicking around. And uh, the reasons for that I think are at least in part because the packaging system is pretty robust and it's pretty simple. It's pretty easy to wrap things up into a package. And uh, also um, R is a, it turns out to be a good tool for reading data from various data sources and munging it and manipulating it so it's a fast, good, sturdy platform. For, obviously you can do that with those kinds of tasks in lots of languages. But R is definitely one of the ones that people consistently use. Uh, and also, throughout, I sort of tried to pull out use our panel talks, that, or use our talks that are sort of relevant examples of people doing this out there in the world. Um, <clears throat> the last of the sort of internal products would be sort of these internal dashboards. And this is really 
come into its own with the existence of Shiny, and that's still proving new technology. So this is this is an internal dashboard that we have created. It's still uh, sort of in prototype R&D phase, but uh, um, it's um, a data mark querier. It's basically uh, we've got a bunch of data sources that are sitting on HDFS. We don't want to support an ETL pipeline to get them into a proper database. So we just let them sit on HDFS, and uh, we give <laughs> internal customers, so basically account managers, salespeople, anybody internally, there's certain data sources that they can request um, through sort of more formal channels. They'll be like our official sort of analytics dashboard will provide certain data requests, but this is much, much closer to the data. And so this is a way that they can basically get a much wider range of things and they can self-serve a whole bunch of data queries without having to ask the very limited data team to do it for them. So it takes a bunch of like small repetitive tasks to <coughs> play if we have this sort of internal dashboard. And uh, so something like this is valuable for a couple of reasons. So why did we do this in R? We did this in R because um, because it gave us a sort of relatively small end-to-end -end platform. We had the data reading, the data munging and processing, and the web app service all in one platform. And it was something where we were going to need a front-end engineer. It's something we can build and maintain entirely within the data team, um, which means we can also change it whenever we want. It's extremely flexible. It's not the most performant thing in the world. It's not the most robust thing in the world. But <coughs> it's very sort of cheap and low rent, and we can, like, um, we can maintain it completely on our own. And so these kinds of internal dashboards, things like that, I hear about other people doing some other things. Like this is a fairly developed example that I know about from us, but other people are doing similar things, and especially with the advent of Shady. So which brings us to kind of the external products, which is a sort of less developed category. And then I sort of identified two types of external product. The first one of which is this customer-facing web app. And I actually had trouble finding any like screenshots that I can really show you. Um, I grabbed a, there's this uh, website out there called Show Me Shiny where people will just put up demos of their shots. So that's where that Dallas police tracker shot is coming from. But uh, that's not actually a business example. But I happen to personally know of many businesses that are doing very much what this McKinsey and Company talk is talking about doing, which is they're, they're using R and Shiny to develop rapid prototypes, their consulting company that they are distributing um, to customers. It's a way to basically build a quick prototype, show things to customers. It's very similar to the internal dashboard idea that I was just talking about, but it's being done as more of a customer serving product. And, and people are doing that. They're not um, really willing to talk about it in public yet. <laughs> um, that's happening, but that's still very sort of new and burgeoning. Um, more developed application for is the analytical backend. You know, you've got some utility where you really just need the libraries that are available to you in R. And so you're going to go ahead and do all of the considerable work it's necessary to scale. Either you don't need scale, and so you're fine with the fact that R is not particularly scalable for something like this, or you do need scale, and you're willing to just do the extra work necessary to get these algorithms parallelized and working. And so we've got two folks on our panel that are supporting um, analytical backends within production. Card.com guys, AJ will be on the panel, and Activision guys, they're both doing that. And then there's also several sort of people talking at the conference. Um, let's see, this deploying R into business intelligence and real-time applications, and then Zillow, it's big data and real-time services in R. Those are both examples of using R as an analytical backend. And just in case that's not like clear what I mean when I say that, um, this is a, our, one of our panelists, card.com, sort of an anal, um, and diagram of their system. And so you've got some sort of complicated customer serving system in place. And you've got a front end, and you've got some kind of uh, a data platform, and, and your data's coming in and out. And you've got some kind of overnight, what they, they have is a kind of an overnight batch analysis job where they're running that stage in Quora. So there's some sort of behind the scenes step that is being run up on. Also along these lines that I came across when I was putting this talk together, uh, this really nice presentation by David Smith from Revolution Analytics on a very similar subject. He put together a whole bunch of really nice slides in there. There's the link um, of other companies doing similar things, like good examples of people using R in business as back-end solutions, as customer-facing front-ends. So if you're interested, you can go check out those slides. 
And just, um, just kind of the last thing I wanted to sort of close on is a little bit, a few words on, on the sort of operational perspective using arm production. So overall, one of the big kind of assets of arm production is um, it's not terribly complex when you compare it to other kind of software platforms that you might want to support. But there are pain points, um, and a lot of this has to do with R is really new to software world, and I think that um, there's just a lot of things that are suddenly problems in software technology that the R community is just never worried about before. There's things that production software needs, features that they need that have never been a concern for the R core group, and so they just never developed those things. Um, and so the, the, the first sort of thing that we've really run into has been all around uh, library management issues. And so typically, like our libraries that we have, we've got some libraries that are on CRAN, we've got some libraries that aren't on CRAN because they're like the newest version or whatever has it needed to CRAN, or there's some reason why that library can't be on CRAN. Um, and then we've got internal packages. And when you're mixed, you've got a hybrid library like that, it sort of breaks whatever version management and dependency management R has, which are, aren't that sturdy, particularly dependency management, that problem. How do you make sure you've truly pulled in all of the dependencies when you bring in something? So in production, you really need to be able to, once you've set up an environment, a library environment, you really need to be able to you know, run a script and completely rebuild it from scratch on a new clean machine and just have it work. And we just haven't really had a lot of luck with that. <laughs> R. Um, and just that whole problem of like really the, the only real utility R has for dependency management is the install packages holding the dependency mechanism. And it goes through kind of the description files of all the sub things as it goes through the CRAN tree. So it breaks if your, one of your things is not in the CRAN. It breaks if the description file wasn't written properly, which, you know, sometimes it isn't. CRAN check does a pretty good job, but uh, sometimes people just write things a little idiosyncratically and there's nothing really fix that. And so it's just a little bit lacking in robustness in that manage. And then there's also not a lot of, it, there's not much in the way of version management, which is remarkably not as much of a problem as you would think because R is, I think, exceptionally good about backwards compatibility. Um, so you don't run into problems with version management as much as you should, uh, given that you're not really managing versions hardly at all. <laughs> um, so those are issues that we certainly run into. Um, other pain points, um, when you're doing anything of, of sufficient complexity, you're probably bringing in a bunch of non-R dependencies, namely C++ and Java dependencies. And that can be sort of, just create an entire sort of level of complexity in terms of supporting it and creating a new environment. Like we certainly ran into in one case where there's an RCPP requirement that one of our servers, the GCC compiler was too old and they couldn't deal with that version of RCPP and it was like, I don't know, we gave up on trying to um, upgrade GCC because apparently that's like the worst thing to ask an ops person to do, is what I learned. <laughs> don't ever ask your ops guy to upgrade GCC. Um, <laughs> so in the end, uh, Francois just fixed it. I think there was a bug fix or something and he just changed it. So that was good. Good job, Francois. But uh, yeah, we read it. You, definitely I found working with Java and working with C++, especially if you're working with a library that pushes a lot of code to Java, Suddenly, you have a situation where a lot of manage, memory management stuff is being done on the JVM, and all of your sort of usual R memory profiling tools and stuff aren't really telling you what's going on. So you have a situation where you need to bring in a Java developer to debug your code. And so that introduces layers of complexity. And so I've learned to be very cautious about libraries, especially calling Java. Like, if they call too much Java, then I'm, I'm very careful about how I utilize those functions. Um, and then, of course, hardware specifications, you know, it's all very RAM hungry, it's like, how much RAM can you actually afford? There's no real solution to that, I don't think. Um, so, in conclusion, what I wanted to sort of get at is, like, why do people choose R? When people are choosing R, what are their motivations? What are they doing with it, and why are they leaning on that tool versus all the other tools? Because almost everything that I've described here could be done with other tools. Um, so why are people reaching for this tool? So when you ask people that, there's sort of two things that they've always said and will always be a really important feature, which is the plotting functionality is best in class, basically. And then the rich analytical library, also pretty much best in class. There's just a bunch of algorithms that you're not going to be able to find anywhere else. And so if you need those, then you need to use R. So those are sort of the like 
this is why I have to use R. But then the kind of next layer of sort of this is why I don't mind too much using R is uh, you know, given that R is, it's, it's, it's pretty much a DSL, it's a domain specific language, but it's sort of more than a DSL. Given that it's, it's basically a domain specific language, it still gives you fairly end to end functionality. You can do almost everything that you would do with a general programming language in R. It's just that lots of those things aren't as well supported as you would in a proper general programming language, but um, you, you can really kind of build soup to nuts kind of products. You can, you can get all, especially now with the development of front end solutions like, like the web app solutions that have come along in recent years. Um, also, solid IDE support, which ends up being really important in practice, and uh, it's a sturdy, stable, easy to support platform when you compare it to lots of other platforms. It's, it's fairly, I mean, I'm always pleased, people are always impressed when I first install R, that it really is, you let go and you double click on the little installer, and then you open it and it runs. And like, it's pretty much usually like that. It's not always like that, but it is pretty plug and play for the most part, and that's, that's really nice. And people turn to R a lot for rapid prototyping. In practice, for whatever reason, you can prototype on lots of platforms, but R ends up being, it's expressive, it's got sort of full, feature functionality, and as long as you're comfortable writing in R, it ends up being a great prototype. So that's sort of setting the stage, I think, for a little bit about what I perceive is what people are doing out there in the business world with this toolkit. Um, again, there's the link to the slides if you're interested. At the end of this, I also, in an earlier version of the talk, I was going to give you a huge list of all the packages that we use, but then it's going to be a terrible talk. So. I just stuck those at the end. So if you're interested in a grand list of all the useful packages, then you can go look at the slides online. And that's my comment. And thank you very much.